Megavanan and welcome my friends to Elven Awakenings, chatting with the Elven Scholar. And now, to your guide to all things Elvish, Dr. Erendil Spindelellis, the Elven Scholar. Once upon a time in a forest rich in pine and oak lived a young elf. He lived amongst his neighbors who were clothed in fur and feather, and found joy and peace with each sunrise and silence in the evening light of the stars. He spent his days communing with his woodland brothers and sisters, and the nights in contemplation and meditation. Light shone upon him unstained from the mortal world, and he was happy. But as time passed, he became more aware of the land outside, filled with fear and despair, and he knew his time of living in the gentle woods was coming to an end, and his journey as a teacher was upon him. When the morning sun found him again, he walked out of the forest with nothing but the clothes on his back and strode into the land of man to teach and to be taught. For it is the way of all teachers that the student so often will be the better master. This is my story, and it is true. My name is Arendil, and I am the Elven Scholar. Megavana, my elven fae, and other kin family, today is going to be a fun show. We're going to delve into one of the greatest mysteries of the Tolkien literature, and that is, who or what was Tom Bombadil? It's going to be a fun ride, so let's get started. Hey, doll, merry doll, ring a dong dillo, ring a dong, hop along, fell the willow. Tom bum, jolly Tom, Tom bum, badillo. Hey, come, merry doll, dairy doll, my darling. Light goes the weather wind and the feathered starling. Down along underhill, shining in the sunlight, waiting on the doorstep for the cold starlight. There, my pretty ladies, river woman's daughter. Slender as the willow wand, clearer than the water. Oh, Tom Bombadil, water lilies bringing. What you just heard was probably the most famous song uh, about Tom Bombadil, and it's a song that he used to sing himself. And it's, it appears on the surface to be very nonsensical, but it is very joyful and happy, and that is uh, kind of the personification of who... Tom Bombadil was in in his attitude towards life. Um, what's going to be important here is the fact that he was so big, he was so strong into music. And we're going to talk about some of the theories about who Tom Bombadil was and uh, what uh, a lot of the people out there are thinking. And I'm going to give a final theory at the end of this uh, lecture here uh, that I thought was rather novel. A lot of this information I'm getting comes from who is Tom Bombadil.blogspot.com. And uh, this individual did an amazing job compiling all the different theories about who he was. But you know what? Before we get into all that, just for those who are not familiar with Lord of the Rings, I'm going to go ahead and uh, again give some of the information from this blog and uh, let's find out uh, some of the basics. So the introduction, it's setting the stage on who he is. Well, it goes, Tom Bombadil is a merry fellow, but beneath his amusing character and actions lies a deep and passionately debated issue. Who is he? What is he? And again, like I said, he's probably one of the biggest mysteries in all of Tolkien's, Tolkien's world. Uh, it's the question which Frodo asks when he first enters Tom's house. Who's Tom Bombadil? And again, this has been debated ever since uh, Frodo asked that question. Okay, so there are, are a multitude of theories. Some people say that uh, Tom was, was God himself. Others say that he was a nature spirit. Others go that he is amongst the Valar or the Maiar, who are, I guess, for those who are not familiar with the Tolkien literature, basically he was, he was like an angel. Okay, well... In the stories, Tom Bombadil is this mysterious character that appears right after the hobbits 
get started on their great journey. And uh, they've entered the old forest, and uh, it's not a safe place for, for hobbits. The trees are angry after a long, long time of abuse of being chopped down. And so they don't care for those that walk on two legs. And the four hobbits are traveling through the old forest. And Old Man Willow begins to cast a spell upon them, a, a spell of sleep, a gentle lullaby that they can barely hear. And it lulls them all to sleep, laying by the Old Man Willow, who is a very old tree, who's over the years has developed a very black heart, uh, again, towards anything that walks on two legs. So he lulls them to sleep and... Two of them are laying against him, and they crack open his his bark and engulfs them and begins to crush them. And Sam and Frodo are all being, basically, Old Man Will is trying to kill them. And uh, Frodo jumps up, and he's running. He was the only one that was able to get away, and he jumps up, and he's running around just just he doesn't even know why he's doing it, but he just starts yelling for help. And he's running around, and he's yelling for help just out of pure desperation. And off in the distance, they hear the song that we just played here. And uh, he hope rises in his heart, and he runs to the voice. And here's this chap um, bouncing down the, the forest trail, singing his song. And... Uh, and it gives, and again, he Frodo runs to him, hoping that he will, for some reason, can grant him help dealing with this tree that is killing his fellows. Well, Tom ends up rescuing the the four hobbits and feels the need to to protect them, so offers for them to come down to his house. They're hidden within the valley of the Withywindle, and uh, from there we get to encounter and learn much about this mysterious man but so many questions are left unanswered so let's give a little description of him as he was described it goes old tom bombadil is a merry fellow bright blue is his his jacket is and his boots are yellow so <laughs> he was considered a bit of an outlandish character the name tom bombadil originally was what the hobbits called him but he had many names but before i get into all that i'm actually going to play a, an audio clip here in just a little bit and uh, I've, why reinvent the wheel this individual and I'll, I'll say who they are here in a moment did such an excellent job on YouTube describing some of the theories and possibilities who Don Bombadil was there's no point in me reiterating it or again recreating the wheel but um, a little bit of the history before we get into that uh, it's originally from a poem uh, called The Adventures of Tom Bombadil that was written in 1934 by J.R.R. Tolkien. It's kind of neat, I don't know how many people know this, but where the original inspiration came from is that uh, one of uh, Tom's sons, uh, he, he loved his toys, and he would tend to lose them, it seems, at times, and uh, Tolkien would comfort him by telling him stories. Well, likewise, Tom Bombadil was originally a Dutch doll, also belonging to Michael Tolkien. Well, John, his brother, <laughs> decided to put the doll down the toilet. And Bombadil was rescued, and from that, Tolkien wrote The Adventures of Tom Bombadil, which was originally published in the Oxford Magazine, again, in 1934. And uh, then Tolkien later offered to his publishers the idea that Bombadil's story could be expanded into a sequel for The Hobbit. Okay, but uh, they didn't bite as Tom appeared anyway in The Lord of the Rings. But originally he wanted to put Tom Bombadil in The Hobbit. Okay, so that was originally who, how we get to the story of Tom Bombadil. Now let's talk about the great mystery behind him. Again, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. What I'd like to do is to go ahead and play an audio clip from a wonderful uh, YouTube channel called The Nerd of the Rings. I love the name. And uh, they go into uh, talking about five of the possible theories uh, behind who Tom Bombadil is. He'll give a little bit more of a description of him. And, and then after that, I'm going to go ahead and talk about some of the spirituality and what I feel uh, Tom Bombadil was real all about and how important his message can be in our lives today. So I hope you enjoy it. 
Tom Bombadil is perhaps the greatest of the many mysteries of Middle Earth. Today we are going to cover five of the most popular theories on who Tom Bombadil actually is. This topic was recently chosen by my Patreon supporters and is a common request on the channel, so I'm excited to dive in. First, let's establish some of what we know of Tom Bombadil from Tolkien's text. We know that the name Tom Bombadil is actually the name which the Buckland Hobbits know him by. And as with many names that the Bucklanders use, it's untranslatable. His other names, however, are translatable. The Elves and the Dúnedain call him by the Sindarin name Iarwain ben Adar, which means oldest and fatherless. The literal translation of Iarwain is Old Young. The men of the Vales of Anduin and of Rohan know him by the Rohiric name Orald, which translates to Very Ancient. Among the Dwarves he is known as Forn. Now in real world Old Norse this means belonging to ancient days. So we obviously get a sense from his names alone that Tom is very very old. Just how old? Well, we need look no further than Tom's own words when the hobbits come to his home. Who are you, master? He asked. Eh, hey, what? Said Tom, sitting up, and his eyes glinting in the gloom. Don't you know my name yet? That's the only answer. Tell me, who are you, alone, yourself, and nameless? But you are young, and I am old. Eldest, that's who I am. Mark my words, friends. Tom was here before the river and the trees. Tom remembers the first raindrop and the first acorn. He made paths before the big people and saw the little people arriving. He was here before the kings and the graves and the Barrowites. When the elves passed westward, Tom was here already, before the seas were bent. He knew the dark under the stars when it was fearless, before the Dark Lord came from the outside. We also know that while Tom's nature is a mystery, he wasn't entirely sealed off from the world by any means. Tom reveals that he knows Farmer Maggot, who he regards as a person of more importance than the hobbits had imagined. There's earth under his old feet and clay on his fingers, wisdom in his bones, and both his eyes are open. We also know he had dealings with elves as he received word from Gildor concerning Frodo's flight from the Shire before the hobbits arrived in the old forest. Another important detail is that he's affected by the ring differently than anyone we know of in Middle-earth or rather, that he isn't affected by it at all, as we see in the story. Show me the precious ring, he said suddenly in the midst of the story, and Frodo, to his own astonishment, drew out the chain from his pocket and unfastening the ring, handed it at once to Tom. It seemed to grow larger as it lay for a moment on his big brown-skinned hand. Then suddenly, he put it to his eye and laughed. For a second, the hobbits had a vision, both comical and alarming, of his bright blue eye gleaming through a circle of gold. Then Tom put the ring round the end of his little finger and held it up to the candlelight. For a moment, the hobbits noticed nothing strange about this. Then they gasped. There was no sign of Tom disappearing. Tom laughed again, and then he spun the ring in the air and it vanished with a flash. Frodo gave a cry, and Tom leaned forward and handed it back to him with a smile. Shortly after this, Frodo decides to test that the ring Tom gives him is in fact his own. As Frodo puts on the ring and disappears, we learn something else about Tom, that he can see its invisible wearer. Come Frodo there, where you be a-goin'? Old Tom's not as blind as that yet. Take off your golden ring, your hand's more fair without it. Come back, leave your game and sit down beside me. We must talk a while more and think about the morning. Tom must teach the right road and keep your feet from wandering. Now with this bit of knowledge, we'll dive into the theories and reveal more along the way. Theory 1. Tom Bombadil is Eru Iluvatar. I'll admit I really like this theory, even though I don't think it's likely. The idea that the creator of the universe spends much of his days in the old forest, awaiting the remaking of the world, helping a bit here and there, but generally letting history play out as it will, is a fun one. Not to mention, it's fun to think that as Gandalf was likely resurrected by Eru himself, that the wizard would have a revelation that Eru was dwelling in Middle-earth this whole time, as Tom Bombadil. It certainly makes the fact that Gandalf spends two years talking with Tom before sailing west even more interesting. Fair lady, Frodo said again after a while, tell me, 
If my asking does not seem foolish, who is Tom Bombadil? He is, said Goldberry, staying her swift movements and smiling. Frodo looked at her questioningly. He is, as you have seen him, she said in an answer to his look. He is the master of wood, water, and hill. Then all this strange land belongs to him? No, indeed, she answered, and her smile faded. That would indeed be a burden, she added in a low voice as if to herself. The trees and the grasses and all things growing or living in the land belong each to themselves. Tom Bombadil is the master. No one has ever caught old Tom walking in the forest, wading in the water, leaping on hilltops under light and shadow. He has no fear. Tom Bombadil is master. One connection here is Goldberry's use of the phrase, he is, in response to Frodo asking who Tom Bombadil is. In Christianity, God refers to himself as I am. So the parallel is easy to draw. We also know that the Christian faith has precedence for God coming to earth to live among its inhabitants. And with Tolkien being a devout Catholic, it's not a stretch by any means. The quickest and most direct way to disprove this theory comes in Tolkien's letter number 181, where he states that there is no embodiment of the one, of God, who is only directly accessible to the Valar. And while there's other holes in this theory, like Tom saying that he is no weather master, clearly Eru could control the weather if he wished, and the elves of Rivendell stating that even Tom would eventually fall to Sauron, Eru himself would not fall to Sauron, even if Sauron possessed the One Ring. Eru is simply beyond anything else in the universe. With these examples combined with Tolkien's own declaration, we can safely disprove this theory. Theory number two, Tom Bombadil is one of the Valar. This is an interesting theory and another one that could explain why the ring holds no sway over Tom Bombadil. However, I think the more we look at the facts surrounding Tom and the Valar, the quicker this argument falls apart. For one thing, we know all of the Valar that exist by name. So this would mean that in order for Tom to be one of the Valar, he would have to be one that we already know in disguise. As I looked online for theories, I found the most common line of thought was that he could be Aule which would make his wife Yavanna Goldberry. While Tom and Goldberry being Valar would also check out with the description of being eldest and fatherless, there's not much else that fits. For one, while Yavanna is the Vala of nature, Aule is a smith and doesn't come across as one as in tune with nature as Tom Bombadil seems to be. While being one of the Valar would explain why the ring has no sway over him, Tom also has no interest in it whatsoever. Gandalf describes this when Elrond, Gandalf, and Aristor talk of the possibility of having Tom Bombadil take the ring himself. But I had forgotten, Bombadil, if indeed this is still the same that walked in the woods and hills long ago, and even then was older than old. That was not then his name. Irwain Benedar, we called him, oldest and fatherless. He is a strange creature, but maybe I should have summoned him to our council. He would not have come said Gandalf. Could we not still send messages to him and obtain his help? asked Aristor. It seems that he has a power even over the ring. No, I should not put it so, said Gandalf. Say rather that the ring has no power over him. He is his own master, but he cannot alter the ring itself nor break its power over others, and now he is withdrawn into a little land within bounds that he has set though none can see them, waiting perhaps for a change of days, and he will not step beyond them. But within those bounds nothing seems to dismay him, said Aristor. Would he not take the ring and keep it there, forever harmless? No, said Gandalf, not willingly. He might do so, if all free folk of the world begged him, but he would not understand the need, and if he were given the ring he would soon forget it or most likely throw it away. Such things have no hold on his mind. He would be a most unsafe guardian, and that alone is answer enough. There's a couple things here that I'll conclude this theory with. For one, the previously mentioned disinterest that Tom has for the ring. If anyone would recognize what the One Ring was, it would surely be Aule, the smith of the Valar. Not only because of his skill, but also the fact that Sauron was originally a Maya that served him. Sauron likely learned much under Aule that he would later twist into the creation of the One Ring. It should also be noted that Aule is the one who sends Saruman to Middle-earth. 
Talk about going a big 0 for 2 on your Maiar, right? Still, he does this specifically to combat the threat of Sauron. It's hard to imagine a Vala this invested in defeating evil would vacation in Middle-earth where he's totally disinterested in the ruling ring on which the fate of the world hangs. Going back to the Council of Elrond, we find out more about what would happen if Tom Bombadil did take the ring. But in any case, said Glorfindel, to send the ring to him would only postpone the day of evil. He is far away. We could not now take it back to him unguessed, unmarked by any spy. And even if we could, soon or late, the Lord of the Rings would learn of its hiding place and would bend all his power towards it. Could that power be defied by Bombadil alone? I think not. I think that in the end, if all else is conquered, Bombadil will fall. Last as he was first, and then night will come. I know little of Arwen save the name, said Galdor, but Glorfindel I think is right. Power to defy our enemy is not in him, unless such power is in the earth itself. And yet we see that Sauron can torture and destroy the very hills. What power still remains lies with us, here in Imladris, or with Círdan at the Havens, or in Lorien. But have they the strength? Have we here the strength to withstand the enemy, the coming of Sauron at the last, when all else is overthrown? I have not the strength, said Elrond. Neither have they. It's hard to imagine that a Vala like Aule, who possesses the ring which has no hold on him, would be unable to ward off Sauron, a Maya, who did not have the ring. But Glorfindel, Galdor, and Elrond all agree that Bombadil, while he would last the longest, would fall to Sauron even if he possessed the ring. Many of these same arguments come into play with any Vala that you would put in Tom's shoes. The other couple I came across for Tom and Goldberry is Orome, the Huntsman, and his wife Vanna, the younger sister of Yavanna, who had influence with the flora and fauna of Middle-earth. This couple seems an even more natural connection than Aule and Yavanna. However, once again we find contradicting personalities. While Orome is described as loving horses, hounds, and trees, he's also described as delighting in hunting monsters and evil creatures. He is also known for his terrible wrath. And we can know just from reading that Tom Bombadil is anything but a vengeful monster slayer. So once again, I think we can safely rule out Jolly Tom being one of the Valar. Theory 3. Tom Bombadil is one of the Maiar. Once again, we see a theory that initially holds some promise. The Maiar are more numerous, and we know fewer of them by name. Balrogs, for instance, were all Maiar corrupted by Melkor. So we have a bit of an opening for Tom being some unknown or unnamed Maya. A Maya living in Middle-earth has precedence as well. It was Melian the Maya, who is the queen of Doriath and wife of the elf king Thingol in the First Age. Melian protected the realm of Doriath with a magical enchantment known as the Girdle of Melian. This enchantment sounds not all that dissimilar from what Gandalf describes Tom Bombadil having over his home in the Old Forest. However, this theory also falls apart as we look at the other Maiar. For one, we go back to the point that the ring has no effect whatsoever on Tom Bombadil. This is in stark contrast to other Maiar like Sauron, Saruman, and even Gandalf. Saruman comes to desire the ring and to rule over Middle-earth, and Gandalf hints at the terrible things that would happen should he take possession of the ring, and this is clearly not the case with Tom Bombadil. Another reason Tom being a Maya is unlikely is the description of how long he has been around. Bombadil, eldest and fatherless, is said to have been in Middle-earth even before the Dark Lord came from the outside. The Dark Lord Tom is referring to here is Morgoth. The Valar and the Maiar, collectively known as the Ainur, help Eru to create the universe through their music, so they would be the first among all of creation. However, we know from Tolkien's text, specifically the Silmarillion, that the Valar were the first to come to Middle-earth. If Tom Bombadil, the first and eldest, was in Middle-earth before the Dark Lord, who was a Vala, he couldn't have been one of the Maiar. Once again, we have a theory debunked. Theory 4. Tom Bombadil is the music of the Ainur. This is a theory that really grew on me during my research. 
While I was searching for theories, I came across a blog series appropriately named Who is Tom Bombadil that did a lot to convince me of this. I'll link it in the description if you're interested in taking a deep dive into this, but I'll do my best to summarize it here. It's actually quite a genius theory. First, let's go just a bit deeper into the music of the Ainur. The music of the Ainur takes place before time begins, after Eru conceives the Valar and Maiar from his thought. These beings, collectively known as the Ainur, are taught by Eru how to make music. Now we could spend an entire video, and likely I will someday, on the music, but long story short, the Ainur make their music, in which Melkor sows discord. Through this music, Eru creates Ea, the universe in which the world of Arda exists. Within the world of Arda, we find the land of Middle-earth. Now this theory goes that Tom Bombadil is the incarnated spirit of the music of the Ainur. According to the theorist, this explains why Tom has the power in his voice to save the hobbits from Old Man Willow and the Barrow Whites. Both of these are examples of things created in the music of the Ainur, but corrupted by the discord of Melkor. Being the incarnation of the music himself, he knows the tunes that can confront and correct them. There's also the fun connection that Tom is constantly singing, and even when he's speaking, much of his speech has a musical or lyrical nature to it. Now, while Tom seems to have the power over Old Man Willow and the Barrow Whites, he explicitly states he does not have this power over ring rates. Out east, my knowledge fails. Tom is not master of riders from the Black Land far beyond his country. Well, this theory has an explanation for that as well. The theory says this is because Sauron is a Maiar. Being one of the Ainur, he is not bound to the music he helped create. The Ringwraiths in turn get their power and their very essence from Sauron himself and his ring. Now the discord of Melkor brings the thoughts of the future Dark Lord into being and is in conflict with the rest of the music of the Ainur. In this way, Tom Bombadil can be in conflict with the things of Melkor's discord, but neither overpowers or defeats the other. They merely compete with one another. Now I know this would naturally bring the objection, why doesn't Tom take a more active role in fighting the darkness if he is capable of competing with it? Well, quite simply, Tom knows he doesn't have the power to defeat things of the discord. However, he is also aware there is an end appointed to the discord by Iluvatar. Bombadil, being eldest and first, has seen the first Dark Lord rise and fall, twice. He has seen the reshaping of the world, and the coming of a second, lesser Dark Lord, who has to this point fallen once before. While the stakes are high for those who have shorter lifespans or are young by comparison, not just mortals here, but many elves as well, in Tom's view, Arda could be close to the second music of the Ainur, when the Ainur, along with the elves and men, will make a music even greater than the first, with everyone in harmony together, creating the world anew. Another area where Tom Bombadil being the embodiment of the music of the Ainur has a strength is the fact that he is eldest and could come before the Dark Lord came from the outside. So if Tom Bombadil is the music of the Ainur, he would have been created as the universe was created. The Dark Lord couldn't have come to the earth before said earth is created. Therefore, Tom could rightfully say he was there before the Valar, which includes the first Dark Lord. Now I know this can be a bit dense and a confusing theory, especially if you're not familiar with the music of the Ainur. So again, if you're interested, I highly suggest you check out the blog post, which I'll leave in the description below. As a fairly recent discovery for me, I really enjoy this one. It makes a lot of sense and doesn't have some of the bigger holes that the previous theories have. It also has the added benefit that it could explain another mysterious character in the same vein as Tom Bombadil, Ungoliant, the mother of Shelob. Regarding Ungoliant, the Cimmerillion tells us, the Eldar knew not whence she came, but some have said in ages long before she descended from the darkness about Arda. So while she takes the form of a spider, she is not simply a spider. In fact, with this theory, it stands to reason that Ungoliant could very well be the embodiment of the discord of Melkor. Like Tom, Ungoliant doesn't overly take sides. She assists Melkor in destroying the two trees, but it's not for the sake of fighting the Valar. It's to quench her own thirst and desire. She almost immediately turns on Melkor, who is rescued by his Balrogs. 
Likewise, Tom doesn't take a side per se, though I believe it's his goodness that leads him to save the hobbits twice. Neither of these characters takes an overt stand on either side, but if they're born of the music and the discord respectively, the assistance they lend makes a lot of sense. As much as I love this theory, I don't think we can bank on this being who Tom Bombadil actually is. When it comes down to it, I think the final theory is the most likely and what Tolkien himself would probably have us believe. Theory 5. Tom Bombadil is Tom Bombadil. Now this might seem like a bit of a cop-out, but I truly think this is the most likely of all the theories. Quite simply, Tom Bombadil is a being unto himself. He very well could have, and likely was, created by the music of the Ainur. Another thing we know about the music is that it's not the Ainur themselves who are doing the actual creating, but it is Eru who creates through the use of the music. While Melkor sows discord and brings about many things that cause evil and trouble down the road, even these are made to ultimately fulfill the plan of Eru, which will eventually lead to the second music. All this to say, Eru could very well have created Tom Bombadil just as he is. He is not there to combat anything or fight anyone. He's just there to be master of his realm and tend to the work that he's constantly referring to, though we don't actually know for sure what that is. Oh, and sing. He is definitely there to sing. And that is a key point. He is there to sing. He's singing when he comes into our perspective for the first time, and he's singing when he leaves. He seems to, almost his language itself is that a song. And that leads us to a very important theory. And I saw this again on who is Tom Bombadil.blogspot. And it was, this, this individual did a great job. He or she proposed that the music had something very, very important to do with Tom. And uh, I love this theory. I think that it has great validity. So let's go into that for just a couple of minutes, and then I'll give you my thoughts on the spirituality of Tom Bombadil. All right, according to the blog, he goes, Since we can safely conclude that Tom is not a Vala or a Maya, nor a nature spirit, the question becomes, what kind of incarnated spirit is he? How do we determine what type of spirit? And the answer is rather simple, and I agree here. Spirits are determined by that which is most central to their character and function. Uh, it's kind of like you can tell uh, a person by the fruit they bear, and uh, that goes the same with him. For Tom, his character is powerful, and yet appears to be limited, but he's the oldest, he's the first, he's the last, and rather joyful. Uh, he functions with and is in close relation to music from the moment we meet him. So when asking what type of spirit is Tom, <clears throat> since he's none of the above, the most logical way to answer is to look at how he acts and to look at the very essence of how he's presented to us by Tolkien. All right, so music. All right, so before launching into this theory, a definition of terms is in order. When saying that Tom is incarnated, I simply mean he is found in the flesh. He is a spirit who has taken on flesh, and this is much like Gandalf and Sodermen have. All right, but here's one of the most important things, and I love this. <clears throat> Being the spirit of the music of the Iron Order. Okay, and for those who are not familiar with that, uh, basically according to Tolkien uh, cosmology, and I agree with this, that the, mus the world was created with music. That, again, we're going to talk about this in a future episode, how we are all part of that music, and we are near, merely notes in the great uh, song of the cosmos, the music of the spheres. And the, mus the universe was created in the song of the Ainur, the song of the angels. And this is an interesting aspect, looking at Tom as if he is the spirit of the music of the Ainur that he is that music personified in a being who then eventually became incarnated in the world. And this why he, he is the first and the last. You know, some people take that and say, well, then he must be God because God is the first and the last. And from my past episode from last week, I talk about who is God. And thou art God. We are all God. We are all aspects and essences of God. And... The spirit of the, the music of the Ainur, the music itself is 
an aspect of God, uh, just another part of God. And so for, yeah, you could argue and you could say, well, if Tom is a, the spirit of the music and the music comes from the Ainur, who, of course, are manifested from Eru, from God, well, then he must be God. And in that sense, yes, Tom Bombadil is Eru, but so are you and so am I. But his manifestation, his aspect of it is as a spirit of the music of the Ainur. You can tell from Tom's behavior that everything he does is wrapped around music and is joyful. And, um, and we know that from the music, all was created. So spiritually, what can we learn from Tom? Okay, one of the most important things is, again, where they talked about the ring, the one ring that even Gandalf was afraid of. Gandalf wouldn't touch it because he knew that he could be corrupted by the ring. And yet Tom could put the ring on and it had no effect on him. Tom was unaffected by it because Tom was created long before it and long before even, uh, uh, even most of the other, well, certainly before the earth was created. Uh, Tom was already there. And so it's, it's, it's easy to say that he's just unaffected by the things of this world because he is literally the music itself. And <clears throat> what can we do with that? Well, for myself, one of the most important things that Tom teaches us is non-attachment. To, to not be attached to things, to he, he never worried, was never concerned. When the hobbits were in trouble, he's rescued them twice within the books. He sh is the epitome of letting go, of not being attached, because he knows that it is all perfect already in and of itself, and that he lives his life and is not hurt by this world. Uh, he is unattached to it and yet is a part of it, is joyful. Um, within so many beliefs, it's called being and non-being. We're both. And Tom Bombadil shows that uh, he can go through life joyfully and be unattached to the outcomes. So for me, that's what Tom shows, is that uh, life is an incredible blessing and that we don't have to be attached to the negative outcomes or to the ideas of others, that their concepts, their worldviews, don't have to affect us in any way if we choose not to. Well, I know that's kind of a simplistic way of looking at it, but uh, that's, that's kind of how I look at Tom Bombadil. He is my absolute favorite character of all of The Lord of the Rings because he shows the absolute acceptance of himself as an essence of God. He is a part of God. He is God. He is what we can all aspire to, to totally manifest that essence of God that we all are. If we just become unattached and let go of other people's worldviews and just let ourselves be who we are. For myself... I know that there is Tom Bombadil within each and every one of us, that we have the potential to be just like him, because we are all aspects of that original music. We're going to go ahead and take a short station break right now, and when we get back, I've got a lot of announcements to make, a lot of good things happening for the new year. So we'll be right back with Elvin Awakenings, chatting with the Elvin Scholar on Heroes and Mortals Radio. We'll be right back. When you go to college, you expect the high halls and libraries filled with old books. But much has changed, and in today's world, online schools have exploded in popularity. Please join us at Lambingo More, the world's first online college with a nod towards Elvin and humankind alike. With Lambingo More, you can start a new career or a new life in the holistic health field. Learn a new Elvin language, study history and culture, or the environment. We believe everyone deserves an affordable education with personalized attention. We provide full certifications in the following fields. Home Herbalist, Reiki Levels 1 through Reiki Master, Nutritionist, First Aid, Elven History and Culture, Elven Languages, Quenya and Sindarin, Anatomy, Botany, Introduction to Archaeology, Ecology, Astronomy, 
and Elevin Laws of Manifestation and Meditation. We also offer full diplomas in the fields of medical herbalist and medical nutritionist. More classes are being added. Many students have already found new careers in these fields. You can pay for your classes outright or join a low-cost monthly subscription, which allows you to take as many classes as you like at one time while you maintain the subscription. This college was founded to give you a chance to expand your horizons while believing in who you are. All classes are certified and are aimed at helping you start a new life and a new career. Adult study programs for both elves and humans alike, designed specifically for you. You can find us at www.elvenscholar.org. Discover what is inside of you. Be who you are at Lambengomor, the Elven School of Lore Masters. Okay, we're back. So I'd like to go ahead and take a few minutes out here and give some of our announcements like we usually do. I've got some fun facts to share about the Lord of the Rings and about Tolkien himself. And then we're going to get into a very special final thoughts before the end of our show. And I've got a wonderful little story to tell in there. All right, I talked about this last week. I just wanted to remind people, um, hoping in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to work it out with the author. But we have a new interview coming up. It's not going to be on Elven Awakenings, but it will be uh, presented on Heroes and Mortals Radio. And it's an interview with the uh, fantasy writer, wonderful author, B.G. Franklin. And like I said, he's a fantasy author of a series of books. Uh, book one and two are out. It's Azalom, Rise of the Mountain God. And book two is Azalom, The Shattered Accord. You can find them both on Amazon. I am very much looking forward to this interview. And like I said, it will be presented on Heroes and Mortals Radio, hopefully here in the next few weeks or so. Okay, uh, upcoming shows next week. We have an interview with uh, Elvin Botanist. Sean McKenzie, all right, he is one who aspires to the elven philosophy and culture and way of life, and he is an actual scientist, a botanist, and uh, currently he is working as one, and also approaches life from an elven point of view, so we've got an interview for him, that is on next week's show, I look forward to it, I hope you guys like it too. Next few shows coming up, we're also going to be talking about, uh, again, as we talked about here today, you are a note in the great cosmic music. And uh, what's really neat is that is right down to the genetic level. And I'm going to be playing for you some of the music and showing some of the science behind what Tolkien was talking about, is that there was an original great music, and we are all truly notes of that music. I'm going to try to have for the show after next week, uh, so next week is the uh, interview with the Elven Botanist. I'm, a try I'm trying to have the show after that because I've had so many requests for it, is how to run a successful Elven Fay or other kin business for financial freedom. I'm not a financial advisor, but um, I'm just going to be telling you my experience of how you can take Elven Manifestation and how you too can produce this this abundance in your life, how you can create your own business if you decide to put the energy into it, and how you maybe can find financial freedom to have those resources to go live the kind of life that you want. I've done this for many, many decades, and I'm going to be sharing my stories of how I did it and how it can be in line with your elven beliefs where you don't feel like you have to compromise for other people's worldviews. And one of the most important things we're going to be talking about is your perspective out or outlook. Do you have a mind that believes in abundance or one versed in poverty? And how much that can affect your manifestation in this world. All right, we're going to be talking about the love of the elves for stars and trees and the earth. We're going to be talking about elven philosophy and karma and how these two work together. And I'll be relaying a bit more of my story about how you can live as an elf in today's world, in a world very much non-elven. We're going to be talking about that as well. Okay, a few fun facts to know and share here. Oh, also going to be letting you know that starting next week, we're going to be bringing story time back into the Elven Awakenings radio show. So... Um, I, I really like having it here, and uh, we'll try to keep everything short, but uh, we are bringing story time back into the show. 
And also starting next week, we will be simulcasting this show on our Elvin Scholar YouTube channel, on the Odyssey video platform, both of those as a podcast, as well as on Heroes and Mortals Radio. It'll be uh, simulcast on all three of those platforms starting next week. So I'm looking forward to that as well. All right, a few fun facts to know and share. All right. <clears throat> This is about Tolkien's mom. This is probably the, one of the great inspirations. It says, not only did his mother introduce reading books and languages to him at a very early age, she also encouraged him to explore botany. She wanted him to enjoy plants from their look to their feel and everything in between. So I guess we can thank Mrs. Tolkien all those years back for encouraging her son and opening him up to a whole new world. And it's kind of neat, the very first line of The Hobbit came to Tolkien when he was grading papers. In a hole in the garden lived a hobbit, was scribbled onto a page of a blank exam paper. That's, that's what he saw, and the rest, as they say, is history. It was often a rarity that you can find a signed copy of one of Tolkien's books, as he hardly ever signed them. He just didn't like to sign, to sign books. Uh, there are, unfortunately, because of that, a number of forgeries out there, but there are some genuine copies do exist. In fact, the 1937 first edition hard copy of The Hobbit, the first edition, which was also signed, was offered for sale for $85,000. I don't know if it ever went through, but... All right, Vigo, all right, most powerful, who played uh, Aragorn in the movies. His most powerful scene in the trilogy nearly killed him. All right, and this seems to have happened to him quite often throughout the, the filming. The only suitable location for filming the Black Gate of Mordor scene, in which Vigo's Aragorn fully embraces his duties as the King of Gondor, and gives his soldiers a rousing speech about how a day may come when the courage of men fails, but it is not this day, was in an area of the Rengipo Desert used by the New Zealand military for training. So it was covered in unexploded arterial, uh, artillery shells. The country's army set up a safe area for filming, and as such, a lot of the soldiers even joined in as orcs, <laughs> as the extras. But Vigo still rode recklessly or outside of that zone in order to fully get into his character. He, he did an amazing job and all that. And there's so much more behind him that we may talk about here in uh, a future episode. Some of the generosity and what uh, uh, some of the things he expressed uh, by fully embracing the character of Aragorn. Okay, so um, I look forward to uh, next week, again, next week's episode. And again, in future episodes, we'll also be talking about Elven Diet um, and escaping the world of illusion and living your own true Elven self. Deep in the forest is a place filled with artifacts of an age gone by, a time when Elven and fairies and all those of other kin knew who they were and remembered our mythic past. It is our pleasure here at Elven Artifacts to present some of those memories. With the rising costs of so many things today, it is becoming harder to find those precious gifts that pass along an air of myth and magic to our homes and to our individual lifestyles. Within this store, you may find that one particular treasure that reminds you of your gentler past, something to help grace your home with our memories. It is our goal to keep everything priced in such a way that makes it available to as many of our gentler folk as we can. Through the magic of 3D printing, we are able to offer them at a greatly reduced price. We are including Elven, Fairy, D&D, &D, and other kin products such as statues, wall plaques, bathrooms, kitchenwares, musical instruments, smartphone accessories, clothes, and so much more. In keeping with our Elven traditions, all items are made from eco-friendly biodegradable materials. The plastic is made from sugarcane and bamboo. You're also welcome to customize your own artifacts. One of the most important features of this store is the ability that allows you to customize an item. You can have your name written in your language or in Elven and even customize the images placed on the items. Please let us know what you're interested in. 
designing and we will try and help you again at an affordable cost. So please feel free to look us up at elvinscholar.org store and we'll do our best to help you find those memories that remind us of our true inner nature. Namarie. It's time for final thoughts and I wanted to cover a topic that we've noticed has been showing itself more and more in the world today and that's with all the quarreling and the arguing and the fighting that's going on in this world. I know that people have gotten very tense and upset but there seems to be so much dissension amongst the people whether it be their families or friends or with religions or the government and so forth and so there's become this vast amount of negativity and arguing and a uh, lack of seeing from other people's perspectives. So what I like to do is I like to narrate a beautiful little story. It's an ancient Buddhist story. I've learned about this quite a long time ago. And uh, it's, it's so simple in how it shows, again, how so many things are, from our, how we view the world from our perspective not realizing that we're just one of seven and a half billion people on this world. Just one perspective out of it all and how much we could learn if we would be open to looking at others. Part of the reason I'm bringing this up <laughs> is because I've noticed that within the new age in Elvin and Fay and other king communities, there's so much division, so much dissent that uh, my way of looking at the new age is appropriate or my way of looking at elves is appropriate. And in the end, we are all, as I said before, just essences of God. We are all a part of God. We are all God. And as elves, we are from that original, beautiful music of the universe. And it's okay if we look at everything from a different perspective. But maybe if we include other people's worldviews, or at least parts of it, you know, in the in the old South, it was a phrase called when you were gleaning the fields, when the farmer would go through and would get all the cotton out or all the corn out. And then people from around the county would come in after the farmer was done and they would glean the field. They would go ahead and grab what the machines or the farmers didn't get, the little bit of cotton or a little bit of corn, and they would grab it for themselves. And that's what we can do within the Elven community or the Fay or other kin community is know that they're just like corn. There are kernels of truth in everybody's perspective. And if we'd be open-minded to looking at their worldviews, not that we're going to accept their whole worldview, but to realize that there may be some truth in there that could be valuable to us. And maybe in sharing ours would give them also more of the complete picture of just who we are within our elven nature. So anyway, it's, it's an old story. It's the story of the six blind men and the elephant. Again, this is a very old Buddhist story, and the story goes like this. Once there were six blind men who stood by the roadside every day and kind of kept back from the people who passed along in front of them. They had often heard of an elephant, but they had never seen one, obviously. For being blind, they would not be able to. It so happened that one morning, an elephant was driven down the road where they stood. When they were told that the great beast was before them, they asked if the elephant driver would let him stop so that they might be able to touch him to kind of get some idea of what he was. Of course, they could not see him with their eyes, but they thought that by touching him, they could learn just what kind of animal he was. The first blind man walked up and happened to put his hand on the elephant's side. And he said, well, now I know all about this beast. He's exactly like a wall. The second man touched the elephant's tusk and he said, my brother, you are mistaken. He is not at all like a wall, but he is round and smooth and sharp. He is more like a spear than anything else. The third man happened to take hold of the elephant's trunk and he said, both of you are wrong. Anybody who knows anything can see that this elephant's like a snake. The fourth one reached out his arm and grasped one of the elephant's legs. Oh, how blind you all are, he said. It is very clear to me that he is round and tall like a tree. The fifth one was very, very tall man, and he got to take hold of the elephant's ear 
Then he said, what, what rubbish? This beast is not at all like any of the things you've named. He is exactly like a huge fan. Now it was the turn of the sixth one. And he reached out and he touched the elephant. And it just so happened he reached and grabbed the elephant's tail. And then he said, Oh, foolish fellows, you surely have lost your senses. This elephant is not at all like a wall or a spear or a snake or a tree. And neither is he like a fan. But he's exactly like a rope. Then the elephant moved on and the six blind men sat by the roadside all that day and quarreled amongst themselves as each one believed that he knew just how the elephant looked and each called the others a fool because they did not agree with him. As time went by later that day, a wise man passing by saw them and inquired about why they were arguing with each other so much. Well, they told him what they thought about the elephant and they asked him to decide who was correct among them about the description of the elephant. Who was right? The wise men said, all of you are correct. And they were shocked after hearing this and asked how that could be possible that all of them could be correct. And the wise men said, each of you has touched a different part of the elephant. And that is why you are all correct as the elephant consists of all these features that you have described. The story of the blind men and the elephant tells us about the reality of life and also about a basic problem that we seem to all have. Often people think that, they, that only they are right and the other is wrong, but they never try to see from another person's point of view. And when people disagree with each other, then they often get into arguments and then arguments often turn into fights. This is the reason that today the quarrels in families are increasing, fights between friends are increasing, the fights between people of different communities and religions are increasing. And the reason behind all this is that we do not try to understand the beliefs of others and only understand our point of view. If we try to open our closed minds and try to understand the thoughts of others, then these petty conflicts in the world will end and a sense of respect for each other's belief will arise, then the spirit of brotherhood and sisterhood will increase in the world, and this world can indeed become a better place for us all to live. Just like touching the different parts of the elephant gave each one their own unique perspective, again, with seven and a half billion of us on this world, with seven and a half billion different perspectives, we each are touching a different part of life. So we each have our own perspective of it. But does that make you right and me wrong or vice versa? No. It's, it's like they talked about Tolkien with the creation of the universe, as we mentioned here, was done in song. The Ainu Lindale is the first book, and it's called The Music of the Ainur. And it talks about how when Eru, when God asked them to, okay, now I have presented to you this, this great theme. Now, make music to that. And it was said in the beginning that they each sang, each of the angels, so to speak, the Ainur. As each sang, they only sang, sang about that part of the mind of God that they, they understood. And so they were all individually singing, or and eventually they became more in tune with each other, and they all slowly began to sing in unison. And that's the way it is with us. We each have our own part of life that we understand. And as part of our growth as elves and fairy and other kin, to begin to expand and understand the perspectives of others, because maybe we can learn from them. And instead of being petty and arguing, and trying to stop others from speaking. Maybe we can all join together and share and we can all learn from each other. Well, as always, thank you for listening, my friends. And until we are together again next week, may you all be blessed by the elves. My name is Dr. Erendil Spindalelis, and I am the Elven Scholar. Namari. 
Megavan and welcome to our YouTube channel, The Gentle Musings of an Elven Scholar. My name is Dr. Arendis Spindalelis, and I am the Elven Scholar. Join me on this journey exploring all things Elven. Learn about Elven culture, healing, diet, meditation, and Elven spirituality. Come and take this adventure with me, and together we can find that inner light and balance that exists within each one of us. Namariye.